Good morning, I'm Dennis Foley from the Medical College of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. I'm going to speak today about mesenteric ischemia and the role of Doppler ultrasound in the diagnosis of this particular entity. We're going to speak today about mesenteric ischemia, the role of ultrasound, particularly Doppler ultrasound in the diagnosis, and its association where clinically relevant with ultrasound, with uh, CT and CT angiography. I have no disclosures to report. The issues relate to clinical presentation of this entity, whether acute or chronic, and the role of cutter and particularly spectral Doppler in the diagnosis and its correlation with intravenous arteriography. We're not going to spend very much time in technique or utility, but simply correlation of intravenous arteriography. Well, here's a NETA diagram that demonstrates the mesenteric vascular system, and our efforts will be concentrated on the proximal superior mesenteric artery and celiac artery. Not to say that disease that affects mesenteric blood flow does not occur in more distal vessels as it does, and also can involve the inferior mesenteric artery. We're not going to be touching on issues that relate to focal intestinal ischemia as may occur in patients with intestinal obstruction and volvulus. So the clinical presentation of mesenteric arterial insufficiency classically is progressive weight loss, food fear in a patient with a vascular comorbidity. These usually are middle-aged patients, usually female, and the food fear relates to the mesenteric angina that patients experience sometime in the nature of 15 to 45 minutes after taking food. That's uh, predictable and leads the patient to uh, concentrate on frequent small meals if possible. The anatomic basis of mesenteric arterial insufficiency is high-grade stenosis, that is greater than uh, 50 and particularly greater than 70 percent stenosis, or occlusion of the celiac under mesenteric arteries, which is combined with inadequate collateral flow. The issue here is that quite a high proportion of the population have atherosclerotic disease of the celiac or mesenteric arteries, but because they have adequate collateral flow, do not manifest any of the clinical symptoms of mesenteric ischemia. Now, the prevalence of mesenteric arterial stenosis reclusion affecting the celiac or supramesenteric arteries in the Medicare age population is actually quite high, up to 18%. 11% uh, of those single vessel and 7% dual vessel. So these patients in very large part compensate for their disease by the development of collateral flow. Here's an example of a Doppler study, a color Doppler to begin with, of the aorta and celiac and superimesenteric arteries. You'll notice that there is cut aliasing, particularly involving the SMA, but that reflects more the angle of incination rather than the presence of an underlying stenosis. And here we are obtaining a spectral waveform from the celiac artery that has a peak systolic velocity of about 160 and a normal spectral waveform with good diastolic flow. And the systolic interval is characterized by a sharp systolic upstroke. Here is the supramesenteric artery. Again, it has a focal zone of cut aliasing, which reflects increased velocity around the curvature of the vessel, as well as the angle of incination. And then we are obtaining a spectral waveform from the proximal SMA, which is normal in terms of peak velocity. And is also normal in terms of waveform characteristics, with a uh, relative decrease in diastolic flow at the beginning of diastole, characteristic of a high resistance circuit, which is the mesenteric arterial system at rest. Here we are further inferior uh, with appropriate angle correction, and again a normal spectral waveform and a normal peak systolic velocity. Having said that, with normal spectral uh, velocities, the latest information in terms of cutoff points for the diagnosis of greater than 50 or 70 percent stenosis is labeled in, these, in this particular slide. Notice, in general, we could say 250 to 300 would cover the spectrum of 50 to 70 percent stenosis in the celiac artery and 300 to 400 in the superimesenteric artery. So here, in general, are the figures that we use for peak systolic flow velocity in the celiac or superimesenteric arteries for a 50 at the lower end to a 70% at the higher end of the velocity uh, scale.
Here's a super mesenteric artery, evaluated approximately, with a normal velocity and a normal spectral waveform. Here's a celiac artery, evaluated, again approximately, with a normal peak velocity at the top left, and a normal spectral waveform. And then here is the same celiac artery evaluated during expiration when the peak systolic flow velocity increases quite significantly, but still within the normal range. And this is something to be expected. You'll notice that there is not only an increase in the peak systolic velocity, but also an increase in the diastolic uh, flow velocity as well. So it's also been found that the uh, characteristics of uh, flow in inspiration and expiration do vary between the, uh, in these two vessels in that inspiration results in a lesser peak systolic flow velocity than does expiration, both for the celiac and the superimmersenteric arteries. Now you'll also note that we are getting close to the cutoff points for the diagnosis of 50% stenosis in the uh, celiac and superimmersenteric arteries, but we actually use inspiration or quiet respiration as the method of obtaining the velocities that we use for the diagnosis of stenosis. Uh, it is just simply taken as a matter of normal uh, flow that there will be this difference between inspiration and expiration that we do expect, but we use the inspiration or quiet respiration as the method of obtaining velocities that we use to determine the presence of underlying stenosis. So here is a celiac artery proximally that is 241 centimeter per second with a normal waveform characteristic. Here it is on expiration where it is increased to 365 and that would be considered abnormal. But here it is on inspiration when it drops to a much lower level. And so again, Expiration is a stress, as it were, where the median arcuate ligament will compress the celiac artery and maybe even the supramesenteric, but we do not use that for the diagnosis of stenosis. Here's the SMA at rest on inspiration and postprandially also on inspiration, with no significant change in the peak systolic flow velocity between those two. We don't use a provocative test meal to evaluate the mesenteric arterial flow velocities. In the past, this has been done somewhat effectively in looking at the response of total blood flow as reflecting in the supramesenteric vein volume flow. And it has been shown uh, that normal individuals with a provocative test meal increase the volume flow in the supramesenteric vein by up to four times, and those with mesenteric ischemia are unable to do this and increase it by less than two. Coming back to diagnostic imaging, here we are with the uh, sagittal view of the supramesenteric artery, which is a curved vessel. We are looking at it proximally, appropriately angle corrected, and with a normal peak systolic flow velocity. We are looking at it in its mid segment, where it is still normal, with a normal uh, spectral waveform. And we are looking at it distally. Again, it is normal with a normal spectral waveform. So we look not only at the orifice of the vessel, but also we look around the curve and distally if it is possible to obtain these velocities. Here is the supramesenteric artery proximally, again with a normal velocity. Um, here we are with the inferior mesenteric artery with a normal velocity and a normal spectral waveform. For the inferior mesenteric artery, we don't have the normative standards that we do have in the SMA and the celiac artery. This is showing us in a lateral uh, CT arteriogram the view of the celiac and supramesenteric arteries and giving us a view of the sonographic window that we have for evaluating these vessels. And you'll notice that we see these vessels with, with a narrow angle of incination until we get to the curvature of the proximal supramesenteric artery. The inferior mesenteric artery is seen more inferiorly, anteriorly, and is usually only imaged when the patient is relatively thin without intervening bowel gas. For the celiac and supramesenteric arteries, we are using the acoustic window provided by the left hepatic lobe. Here is the celiac artery evaluated during inspiration and subsequently during expiration, again showing you the increase in flow velocity with
expiration as compared to inspiration, but again, that is not used diagnostically. Here is the sagittal view of the superior artery. Here is the bend in the superior mesenteric artery. Here we are more distally in the superior mesenteric artery, again with normal waveforms, both proximally and distally. Here is the inferior mesenteric artery evaluated in this patient, and again we see a normal waveform characteristic with a relatively high peak systolic low velocity, but uh, one which uh, in this particular circumstance is combined with normal patency of the celiac and superior mesenteric arteries. So to summarize, celiac and mesenteric Doppler studies are performed in the fasting state. We do use inspiration and expiration imaging, but rely upon inspiration or quiet respiration for determining peak systolic flow velocities. And we do not employ a pre- or post-provocative test meal because its only value is in looking at superior mesenteric venous flow, uh, and that is not routine uh, clinical practice. Here is an example taken some years ago of a patient who had a flow jet, which was not angle dependent, in the superior mesenteric artery, and had a very high peak systolic flow velocity of almost 500, with a ratio of SMA to aorta of greater than 3.5 to 1. The same patient, celiac artery, again had cataracting, perivascular tissue brewing in this particular case, with a peak systolic flow velocity, again, which was 357, which was abnormal, and a high celiac to aortic uh, peak systolic flow velocity ratio. And in this patient, the collateral blood supply came from the inferior mesenteric artery, where we had both an increase in systolic flow, but particularly a more robust diastolic flow in this particular instance, indicating that the collateral flow was supplying a relatively low resistance, more distal circuit, as occurs in patients who have proximal SMA stenosis. Here's an example of a sagittal view of the proximal SMA, which is normal in terms of velocity. Somewhat more distally, in the mid-segment of the SMA, we have a significant increase in peak systolic flow velocity to 392, and more distally, it decreases. So in this particular case, we made a diagnosis of not an orifice SMA stenosis, but a more distal downstream SMA stenosis, and this was confirmed uh, by the intravenous CT arteriogram, showing you both a focal area of dissection and aneurysm, and then a stenosis at the distal extent of that disease. Here's an example of a celiac artery study during inspiration and expiration, with an increase in expiration as expected, but the peak systolic flow velocity greater than 450, obviously abnormal, and combined with the Evaluation of the hepatic artery on inspiration and expiration in both uh, respiratory phases demonstrating tardis parvus waveform. So we, here we have downstream tardis parvus waveforms being used to substantiate the presence of a proximal celiac artery stenosis with an elevated peak systolic flow velocity. Here's another example of an hepatic artery. Uh, tardis parvus waveform in a patient who had a stenosis of the supramesenteric artery that you see detailed with that particular arrow and a uh, very short segment of cataracting. Here's another example where we have the aorta with a normal peak systolic flow velocity with the SMA being recorded as also normal uh, just at its orifice but more distally we have a very high peak systolic flow velocity. Let me stop there. This is an example of a patient uh, in which we have uh, a spectral waveform obtained adjacent to the orifice of the supramesenteric artery where the velocity is normal. Within the supramesenteric artery where we have a markedly increased peak systolic flow velocity. And in this particular circumstance, the hepatic artery demonstrated a very abnormal waveform where I believe uh, systole is on the upslope of the uh, spectral waveform and at the end of diastole we have a total cutoff in blood flow. So that was expiration and here the comparison with inspiration showed a
more characteristic Tardis Parvus waveform. So this is a interesting uh, demonstration of a uh, very abnormal spectral waveform obtained during expiration, extending Tardis Parvus waveforms flow characteristics to showing absence of flow in end diastole. Again, a significant increase in peak systolic flow velocity in the celiac artery with a prominent increase in diastolic flow and the hepatic artery demonstrating a tardis parvus waveform to, again, corroborate the hemodynamic significance of the celiac artery stenosis. Another example of a patient, in this particular case, the peak systolic flow velocity in the celiac artery was at the, at the cutoff point, uh, suggestive of a significant stenosis and confirmed by the presence of the uh, hepatic artery expiration image demonstrating tardis parvus waveform. And then this was confirmed by intravenous arteriography demonstrating the typical appearance of a celiac artery compression of the proximal uh, celiac artery by the median arcuate ligament. Aneurysms can also be demonstrated by imaging techniques. Here's an example of a celiac artery aneurysm on a CT arteriogram involving the more distal aspect of the celiac artery. And here is the Doppler study that demonstrates the aneurysm and its dimension. These aneurysms can be associated with proximal celiac artery stenosis due to median arcuate ligament compression, or they can be associated with segmental arterial mediolysis, a condition in which the wall of the celiac artery degenerates and the pathology approximates that what one would expect to see in fibrodysplastic disease of the renal artery. We're now turning our attention to stents. In a patient who's got a stent in the celiac artery, the superior mesenteric artery, and the inferior mesenteric artery. Again, looking at the celiac artery, the superior mesenteric, and the inferior mesenteric artery. In this particular circumstance, the curved plane reformations with CT demonstrated normal patency of the celiac, the superior mesenteric, and the inferior mesenteric arteries. The Doppler study demonstrated aliasing involving the celiac artery with a peak systolic flow velocity still within the range of normal but getting close to 250. In the proximal SMA, still within the range of normal, again with aliasing in the lumen, uh, but getting close to the 50% cutoff, and more distally, extending beyond that particular level, which would in a native vessel suggest a 50% uh, or close to 70% stenosis. The issue with these uh, vessels in stents is that the vessel has lost its compliance. In a vessel that loses compliance, the peak systolic flow velocity will compensate by increasing. So studies have shown that in patients with stents involving the celiac artery and the supramesenteric artery, the peak systolic flow velocity for a greater than 50% stenosis is elevated uh, above what we would expect in patients with a uh, unstented celiac or superior mesenteric artery. Here's an example of a patient who's got a stent in the celiac artery on a CT study, transverse image, whose SMA is occluded, and whose curved plane reformation through the celiac to the hepatic artery demonstrates normal patency. And in this particular case, the celiac artery evaluated in expiration in stent demonstrates a normal velocity at 200 centimeter per second. And we substantiate the fact that it's normal by also looking at the hepatic artery in the decubitus position, showing a normal spectral waveform and no tardis parvus characteristics. In looking at the endovascular therapy for mesenteric ischemia, this was a small study published a number of years ago. And the main point is that most patients with mesenteric ischemia who have transvascular intervention require more than one stent. That these patients may have secondary interventions and it's an important role for Doppler ultrasound in evaluating patients with stents to determine whether or not an instant stenosis has occurred so that appropriate management can be instituted. Patients may, instead of having stents, and this was more common uh, 10 to 20 years ago, have had a surgical bypasses. This is an example of a supraceliac to mesenteric artery surgical bypass. Again, an AP view of the same bypass. 
If there's appropriate acoustic access by the left hepatic lobe, this particular type of bypass can be imaged by sonography. And again, uh, the flow characteristics criteria should be similar to those of native vessels. This is not a standard vessel with the loss of compliance. Here's another example of a prosthetic graft from the infrarenal aorta to the superior mesenteric artery, which potentially could be evaluated by Doppler ultrasound, but depends upon the degree of overlaying bowel gas. Uh, these are now more of historical rather than practical interest because most patients with disease these days are treated by endovascular techniques rather than by surgical bypass. In terms of the surgical management of intestinal ischemia, its major role is in the, in the treatment of patients with acute mesenteric ischemia. In those patients who may require acute um, thromboendiorectomy or thromboembolectomy, notice that the perioperative mortality in patients with acute mesenteric ischemia can be quite high, though the five-year patency rate is quite good. So to summarize for endovascular and surgical management, endovascular techniques are favored for treatment of proximal arterial disease in both acute and chronic intestinal ischemia. That surgical bypass or thromboembolectomy is utilized for acute mesenteric occlusive disease, but not for stenotic disease. So in summary, mesenteric vascular insufficiency, we have looked at the diagnostic criteria utilizing both the clinical presentation, the vascular imaging studies, and basically utilizing these to determine a therapeutic approach. And if the patient has intervention, the therapeutic response, that is the, uh, the cure of the patient's mesenteric angina, is the ultimate uh, diagnostic uh, arbiter. We've looked at patients with chronic mesenteric ischemia predominantly, and those uh, patients presenting with typical clinical symptoms, the imaging role of ultrasound is critical, and ultrasound is also used in the post-intervention uh, evaluation of these patients. Patients with acute mesenteric ischemia usually have uh, CT imaging for their evaluation, and that may be combined with CT arteriography. A diagnosis is based upon that imaging appearance as well as clinical presentation, and imaging usually is reserved for the follow-up of those patients following their surgical uh, management. Just to finish this particular uh, uh, presentation on mesenteric and celiac artery disease, I'll just demonstrate to you some patients with liver transplants where the same principles and the same vascular field apply. This is a patient with a liver transplant who has a normal portal vein uh, flow velocity and flow characteristics, who has also a normal appearance of the celiac artery. This will be proximal to the anastomosis for the transplant hepatic artery. Again, here's the celiac artery, which is normal. And when we look at the hepatic artery, though, at the hepatic hilum, we notice there's a tardis parvus waveform. And we look at the intrahepatic arterial flow waveforms for both the right and the left hepatic artery, it is abnormal tardis parvus. So we can therefore presume that between the native celiac artery and the transplant hepatic artery at the hepatic hilum, the patient has an arterial stenosis almost certainly at the surgical anastomosis. And in fact, that was confirmed in this particular case uh, where we have on the top left the intravenous arteriogram. We have the uh, Doppler studies that demonstrate the critical information of a normal celiac artery trunk, peak systolic flow velocity and waveform characteristics with the tardis parvus at the hepatic hilum and then the confirmation during intervention where the catheter is being placed in the celiac artery and we see a stenosis at the anastomosis. This is another example of a patient with a liver transplant. In this particular case, there is a very high flow velocity in the hepatic artery at the hilum with a tardis parvus waveform intrahepatically in the right hepatic artery and also the left hepatic artery. So what this patient has, again, is a stenosis and the surgical anastomosis in this case closer to the hilum than we had in the first particular case. And that is now demonstrated in this collage where we again have the Doppler waveform characteristics, the first diagnostic test, and then the confirmation by intravenous arteriography showing you an anastomotic stenosis in this case very close to the hepatic hilum. So that is the finish of this presentation. I hope that you have enjoyed listening to this and have picked up some pointers that's going to be useful in the diagnosis of celiac and mesenteric arterial disease.
in patients who are presenting with mesenteric angina who progress through the process of evaluation, have corrections, and have uh, post-surgical or post-intervention follow-up. Thank you.